Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our viewers from around the world. Welcome to the third event of the IU Early Career Astronomer ECA Online Discourse Series. My name is Maria Drazdowska, and I will be one of the moderators of today's online discourse. I'm a research fellow at the Center for Space and Habitability at the University of Bern in Switzerland, and at the moment, I'm also honored to serve as the co-chair of the IU Working Group of Junior Members. Hello everyone, I'm Camilla Danielski. I'm acting as a second moderator for today and I'm a postdoc at uh, the University the Institute of Astrophysics of Andalusia. And uh, welcome everyone. So today online with us, we have Professor Dr. Xavier Barguns, the Director General of the European Southern Observatory, ESO. Xavier received bachelor's and master's degrees in physical sciences from the University of Barcelona in 1981. His PhD degree in statistical physics was awarded to him in 1985 by the University of Cantabria in Spain. Following his studies, Xavier began his academic career at the University of Cantabria, first as a teaching assistant and then as a lecturer, until he took up the role of senior research scientist at the Spanish Council for Scientific Research, abbreviated as CSIC in 1993. In parallel, during the years of 1986 and 87, he moved to Cambridge University in the UK as a postdoctoral fellow, and there interned there as a sabbatical visitor in 1997. He was promoted to CSIC Research Professor in 2002. Xavier served with ESO in many different roles, including ESO Council President from 2012 to 2014, he has dedicated significant effort to help progress major ESO projects, including the ALMA Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, ALMA, and the Extremely Large Telescope, ELT. Xavier's research has been focused on astronomy at X-ray wavelengths and includes obscured galactic nuclei in the distant universe, the evolution of the Aegean population, and the apparent mismatch between the X-ray and optical views of Aegean. Starting in 1996, he served as a co-investigator with the XMM Newton Survey Science Center, and most recently he has actively pushed for large X-ray observatory missions, such as ESA's Advanced Telescope for High Energy Astrophysics or the Athena mission. Xavier has served as the ESA Director General since September 2017, and today he will deliver a talk for us entitled ESA, the Most Powerful Telescopes and the Community of Practice. Before we begin, Camille will tell us how this discourse will proceed. Today, we'll, we will be having like a 30 minute talk and then uh, followed by 30 minutes discussions. So in the discussion, you will have the opportunity to actually ask questions. Please uh, use the Q&A feature that you have uh, on, uh, on Zoom because that's gonna be much easier for us to uh, follow up on your questions this is the preferred mode. However, for the people that are watching on YouTube, you can uh, like uh, write your question in the chat. We will keep track of that as well. And in case uh, we run out of time, we will take note of the remaining question and we will try to answer in writing. So I think uh, I'm gonna leave it to you, Xavier. Uh, you can begin. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation um, uh, to uh, this, this yeah, uh, for spiritual form of this of this workshop, um, I'm very pleased of having been invited. A little bit overwhelmed, I have to say. Um, and uh, you asked me to say something about myself. This is something that I very rarely do. I don't think I have very much to say about myself, but here it is anyway. That's my slide, my introductory slide. Um, I'm above uh, anything a scientist and an enthusiast of astronomical research. As you said during the introduction, I began my career uh, from the theoretical physics side of things. I did my PhD on statistical physics. Um, I, I studied stochastic processes and, and uh, statistical mechanics applied to very hot plasmas, then moved to astronomy, started working on the intergalactic medium actually, and uh, then moved into X-ray astronomy. Um, as you uh, well said, uh, my main interests in research are uh, around AGNs and uh, galaxy co-evolution, um, X-ray surveys, and also um, I keep an interest on the intergalactic medium that I have studied both at UV optical and X-ray wavelengths during the years. 
Um, in, 19, in the 1990s, um, while I was a lecturer at the University of Cantabria in, in, in the northern um, of Spain, I got a position with the Spanish Council for Scientific Research, a, a senior research position. And I was asked to, to lead the, um, let's say, the foundation of a new institute uh, of a joint venture between the, the Council for Scientific Research and the University. Uh, it's, it's called IFCA, Institute of Physics of Cantabria. Um, we succeeded in setting this up um, more than 25 years ago. Uh, this has now become a, a moderately sized institute in Spain doing research in astronomy and fundamental physics, essentially. I was the founding director. Um, also, when coming back from Cambridge, um, I um, managed together with a number of colleagues to establish the first X-ray astronomy group in, in the country, which it's uh, still a very active um, enterprise and um, a, a reference for for many international collaborations. Um, thankfully, there's a lot more of X-ray astronomy and astronomy in general going on in Spain at the moment. Um, for years, uh, for over a decade, I advised the Ministry of Science in whatever name it had in Spain um, in advising them on astronomy matters and in particular on, on research infrastructures. Um, I, I took a very active part in the negotiations for Spain to join ESO. Uh, that took almost two years. Um, I was very happy to see this uh, concluding successfully in 2006. Uh, so um, I was also appointed as a punishment member of the ESO Council starting in 2007, where I served representing Spain for a number of years. Then I, I stepped down, but uh, became council president for three years. Um, all, in all this time, my main uh, scientific interactions led me to a number of engagements with ESA, with the, with the European Space Agency, in particular with the science program. I served in the Space Science Advisory Committee in the Astronomy Working Group. I was heavily involved in XMM Newton. I chaired the Users Committee. I served in countless occasions on the Time Allocation Committee. And, and I'm, I'm very happy that this, this mission is still delivering um, world-class science uh, 20 years after the launch. Um, as it has also been said, um, this is maybe an example on how long these things take. Um, when I joined the first uh, thoughts in Europe um, to push for a new um, uh, large X-ray observatory in space that would replace XMM Newton, um, I was uh, by far the youngest of the team. Um, that was in the early 2000s, actually. Um, I mean, all the people that served in those um, bodies and committees, they are all uh, retired, um, if not gone, actually. And uh, so, uh, and the mission is still in uh, the early stages of being built. This is Athena, um, which is now part of the ESA program. But um, don't forget that to get to here uh, with the launch with a target launch date in the early 2030s, there's already 15 years of work behind. So that's the time scale. It's it's a lifetime that uh, that you have to face to um, to push for one of these big enterprises, uh, both in space and in the ground. There's no big difference nowadays between um, such a big space observatories or observatories in the ground, like the ones that we have at ESO, like like the VLT, Alma, or the ELT. Those are lifetime long um, projects, in fact. So I'm um, uh, very happy today to talk to you um, in my capacity as Director General of ESO. This is a challenge that I took over in September 2017, uh, more than three years ago. Um, um, again, this is uh, the vision that we have as an organization, and this is what keeps me busy these days. Uh, there's not much time to uh, work on supermassive black holes anymore, um, but I, I think this this is um, uh, it's very satisfying to see when others can make use of the infrastructures, the observatories, and everything that we operate, and um, and they succeed with the science that they can do thanks to that. So for us, the target and the vision now is to deliver the ELT. I will be talking about these telescopes in a few minutes uh, for operation while keeping uh, the VLT and the VLTI 
and ALMA at the forefront of worldwide astronomy. This is essentially to maintain um, um, an European leading role in ground-based ground astronomy. So um, let me talk about ESO now. This is uh, as much as I wanted to say about myself. Um, so what is ESO? Uh, uh, those of you who uh, work in Europe probably know um, this, but still let me say it anyway. Um, uh, ESO means either European Southern Observatory, although our formal name is the European Organization for Astronomical Research in the Southern Hemisphere. We are a treaty organization. We're an intergovernmental organization, meaning that um, we uh, are there because governments and parliaments of member states signed our convention. And the first time this was signed by five countries was in 1962 uh, with the mission of building and operating world-class ground-based astronomical facilities and to foster collaboration in astronomy. At that time, this big astronomical facility was a three meter telescope to be placed in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, that telescope still exists. It's a 3.6 meter telescope in La Silla and it's still delivering fantastic science, in particular in radial velocities for planet searches and, and other purposes. Um, we're a science-driven organization. This is what we uh, do for a living. We deliver data and we deliver projects that deliver data ultimately. And this, this is what we uh, provide to the, to the community um, to uh, further our understanding of the universe. This, of course, a number of other impacts and other values, and I will come back to this at the end of the short presentation, because this is also something which I believe it's very, very important to realize. We give um, to society much more than, than just data. Um, of course, we're not alone in this enterprise. We, there's uh, a number of other ground-based um, facilities and organizations, and also uh, most of what we do, we also uh, target similar goals as to uh, uh, for example, the ESA science program or NASA or JAXA. Um, and again, and that's a very important context that uh, concept that I would like to come back in my very last slide is that whatever we do, we do in collaboration with scientists, with R&D institutes and in fact with industry among other stakeholders. So we're, we're not an isolated organization at all. Um, today, ESO contains um, 16 member states. Um, in addition, we have a 10-year partnership with Australia that began in 2018 uh, with the hope that uh, this would uh, lead um, into full membership from Australia. So they may become yet another of our ESA member states. Um, we did sign the accession agreement with Brazil a decade ago, but this uh, process was not completed and uh, it's not expected to be completed anytime soon. To give you a size, a flavor of the size of the organization, uh, there's about 750 people uh, these days working at ESO, about 450 uh, here in Garching in, in Germany, in the north of Munich, and uh, around another 300 in the various sites in Chile. Our budget uh, for this year is about 300 million. That includes uh, the uh, necessary funding to proceed with the construction of the ELT. Um, I already mentioned our headquarters are here, and not to be forgotten, we uh, like to play a role in European science policy and uh, feel part of the European research area. So we do have a number of links and specific agreements there with ESA, with CERN, with our forum, European Commission, etc. Um, this is a summary of our ESO sites. Um, I've said most of it already. Uh, we operate in a number of places. In Chile, we have offices in Santiago and, of course, observatories in, in other uh, more interesting sites in the um, Atacama Desert, and I'm, I'm going to flash you through this. Um, our portfolio consists of uh, formally these this, this four programs, um, as we like to call them. Uh, first is uh, La Silla Paranal. This is the optical infrared observatory, which has three sites, actually and it's in full swing of operation since a number of years. Our second observatory in operation is ALMA, which is actually a partnership with other international partners. Our third program is the ELT, the Extremely Large Telescope, which is in construction. And we have a fourth program, which is the uh, southern part of the Cherenkov Telescope Array, um, which um, um, an, a, another entity is constructing and that we will um, eventually um, operate in the future. 
So this is the first observatory that is established in the Southern Hemisphere in Chile. That's 51 and a half years ago now. Um, um, it used to be a very crowded place. Uh, now it's not so longer uh, crowded. Uh, we still operate these two telescopes. One is the foundational 2.6 meter telescope, uh, which is focusing mostly, mostly on radial velocities, as I said. And then the NTT, which was the first telescope to uh, actually feature active optics, uh, which uh, it, it corrects the, uh, the figure of the primary mirror when it, it moves and bends. Um, and this one is mostly focusing on transient science. Um, on top of this, La Silla also hosts a number of uh, telescope projects from institutes and other entities. Um, um, and you have a couple of examples here. Um, you have uh, the Black Jam project, these three mushrooms um, on top of um, a column there. Um, this is again for transient science, while at the bottom we have extras, which is for transit. Uh, for exoplanet transit uh, projects. Those are very often uh, operated remotely and, and we simply provide the technical support when needed. Um, La Silla was blessed last year with the total solar eclipse in July 2019. That was a fantastic experience, I can tell you. Uh, it was my first total solar eclipse and um, it was only the third time to the best of my recollection that uh, such an event could be seen from a professional observatory as it was in La Silla. Remember that this is a site that normally hosts about 50 people at most. Um, and that day we had a thousand guests uh, on the site. So it was a big stretch for us, but it was fantastic. It was, it was a big event uh, where we achieved a very important goal, which is um, a, a very good um, 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 uh, convergence uh, with uh, the society and with the community. Uh, we had numbers of guests, uh, including some authorities, the president of Chile, uh, ministers, and many others. It was really a fantastic experience where astronomy met society. Um, uh, this is Paranal. This is where uh, the most powerful uh, optical infrared observatory in the world is based. Um, it consists of these four unit telescopes eight meters across um, uh, in the primary mirror for each one of them, plus the four smaller auxiliary telescopes, which can be moved uh, in this platform and do interferometry. Also, uh, the four uh, big telescopes can do interferometry. All the infrastructure for the interferometry, it's below the platform that you can see. There's delay lines. There's a lot of fantastic equipment there that enables us to operate in a rather unique um, facility uh, by doing uh, um, interferometry in the infrared for the time being in the near and mid infrared. Um, um, Paranal is so powerful because uh, we have a huge variety of instruments that cover almost every corner of parameter space that you can dream of um, together, uh, you know, when uh, every of the units uh, works um, in isolation or whether they, when they work together, either in an interferometric mode um, or in a mode where they simply put their light into the um, focus of a single instrument, uh, as it's the case of Espresso, which is a higher resolution, ultra stable um, spectrograph. Um, one of the UTs, as you can see, uh, is equipped with a laser guide star facility that enables uh, adaptive optics, um, where you correct in real time for the uh, turbulences of the atmosphere. Um, and uh, this is now in regular operation. It has a very low uh, downtime, and, and this is really now a workhorse and the facility that we can offer to the community. Here's some pictures of what we have in there. Um, you have the laser guide start in operation in UT4 at the top. Um, at the top right, you have MUSE, which is um, an IFU, an integral field unit, something that we X-ray astronomers like a lot, although this one works in the optical. Um, and um, it, it provides, of course, a spectrum for every pixel um, in your image, and that's incredibly powerful. Uh, below, you have on the left-hand side uh, the delay lines uh, in the tunnels below the platform and uh, at the right-hand side uh, below we have gravity, which is a beam combiner um, uh, of four beams, uh, which enables interferometry 
um, uh, of unprecedented uh, quality, actually. And that has been instrumental, as I will uh, say in a minute, uh, for uh, um, work that has led to uh, the Nobel Prize in 2020. Um, the success of Paranal is based on a, a, a concept that uh, um, we generically call the Paranal model, which is that we at ESO build the telescope and all the infrastructures. All these tunnels are built by us, but the instruments, uh, the specific instruments that go into the focal plane, they are built by consortia um, together with us. The consortia are um, um, yeah, groups of uh, R&D institutes, mostly in the ESO member states. Um, uh, we at ESO provide um, uh, funding and uh, in uh, the institutes, they generate their own effort, their, their own FTEs, their own work for this. Um, when the instrument is finished, we receive it, we commission it, we accept it, and then we uh, in ingest it in our system and we operate it uh, together with the entire facility. And we have a very stringent target technical downtime, um, uh, which is below 3%. So when we are on sky, we want to make sure that we do science. Of course, this is all fantastic, um, but uh, you're all aware that since March is here, we are facing a, a different challenge, which is a pandemic. Um, uh, uh, this is the, the COVID-19 situation. We had to shut down our observatories in March, late March we did. Um, now, um, during this year, we have been working together to put uh, in place a ramp up of our facilities whenever this uh, would become possible. I'm very happy to report that uh, uh, as of two days ago, uh, the four eight meter telescopes in Paranal are back on sky um, with one instrument each only. So it's it's a limited science uh, machine, but uh, we're very happy to see the photons flowing again and delivering science. And this is actually a picture of the first time that we could open the four domes um, last Monday, actually. Um, there's a third small component of this observatory in operation. This is now at 5,000 meters altitude in the Chagnantor Plateau. This is called Apex. This is a 2 millimeter single dish telescope, 12 meters across. Uh, this is already a partnership with the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn and the Onsala Space Observatory in Sweden. Um, this is actually a project with limited duration. Uh, we're in, in one of the extensions now, which ends in 2022. Um, and uh, that's essentially um, uh, going to be the uh, ramp down of the ESO engagement with the project, although we're talking about the possible extension for another few years, uh, but in a totally different model. Um, Apex has, uh, of course, provided a lot of very good science, and it was quite important at the beginning to, um, to fit uh, ALMA with targets. Um, again, in a normal semester, we do get a lot of uh, science time in our facilities. That's very good. We try to keep the technical downtime uh, very low. And the, the sites where uh, the telescopes uh, sit are normally very good, so we don't have gigantic weather losses. Um, ALMA, I already mentioned this several times. Uh, this is the uh, this unique interferometer that we share with North America, uh, the National Science Foundation, and NINS, the National um, Institute for Natural Sciences in Japan. Uh, the array, it consists of 66 movable antennas at 5,000 meters altitude in this plateau, which spans 16 kilometers. It enables a number of different configurations. So you can do uh, um, yeah, either a very compact uh, configuration with a bigger field of view or, or a very extended configuration with a higher resolution and smaller field of view. Our uh, operation support facility is at 3,000 meters, uh, so that's workable. Uh, we have a rather interesting governance for ALMA, given that this is a three-party uh, project um, and the operation is supported uh, um, uh, not only in Chile, but also by uh, three places in the Northern Hemisphere, um, uh, which is where the three executives reside. And ESO is one of these executives and actually the um, uh, the support to science operations uh, through the Alma Regional Center is in Europe uh, shared um, across a number of nodes which are distributed geographically and that uh, work together to, to support the operations. Here are some pictures of some of the 
of the stuff that we have uh, a really fascinating, interesting machine at 5,000 meters altitude, uh, uh, including this very powerful correlator that uh, we're uh, actually um, thinking about upgrading already now. And, and uh, most of the operations are done, as I say, at, at 3,000 meters. Um, the ELT, the Extremely Large Telescope, that will be the biggest of this uh, class of telescopes in the coming uh, decades, 39.3 uh, meter segmented primary mirror, almost 800 segments on this mirror, uh, plus the spares. We started construction in 2015. Um, the target uh, technical first light is in 2025. Our cost to complete, it's around 1.3 billion euros. Uh, that is being erected in Cerro Amazones. This is very near uh, Paranal. It will actually be operated as part of the Paranal Observatory. And this is a key ingredient of, of our business model. We will operate the ELT together with the VLT. This is a picture of the uh, current state of the works at the site. We, they had to be interrupted during, uh, due to the pandemic. Um, at the bottom uh, right, you have the technical facility, which is not in Amazonas, it's actually in Paranal. That was also delivered recently. Unfortunately, we cannot do much more at the moment, uh, also due to the pandemic. There's a lot of progress with the manufacturing of the components, with the engineering in Europe. Um, so industry and ourselves are working at full throttle on uh, the mechanical devices, the optomechanics, the mirrors, the polishing. It's all incredibly tricky, as you can imagine. And uh, this is only the fabrication of the various pieces. Then you have to put them together and make them work as a real astronomical telescope. This will be a big challenge, and we're aware of this. Uh, uh, just one word about the last uh, part of this portfolio, which is the Cherenkov Telescope Array. As I said, we're part of the project. We're not building it, uh, but we will operate it. And the site for the Southern Array has been decided. And it's um, in between actually Paranal, which is where the VLT and the VLT I reside, and Amazonas, where uh, the ELT resides. Um, um, we do spend quite a lot of effort in keeping um, a good uh, archive service. Uh, and uh, this is the archive science portal that now can access uh, both uh, optical infrared data from La Silla and Paranal and ALMA as well. So we're, we're going into a further integration of the archives of all these facilities to enable uh, better synergies with the science as well. Um, this is actually the number of refereed papers that are published every year um, using ESO facilities. Uh, we're exceeding 1,000 uh, as of three years ago. Um, and as uh, you can um, imagine, these components here from the VLT, from ALMA, and from, from La Silla, the VLT is, of course, the most productive part of it. And this is also an important um, element to uh, think about, uh, which is that 35% of the VLT-based papers are actually using archival data. Uh, and about half of them only use archival data. So they do not require new observations, which is very good. So I'm very proud that ESO has um, a, a big, um, well, several seats on this future landscape of astronomy, of the biggest infrastructure in astronomy in the 2030s. Of course, this is very European based. That's where we live and operate. Um, but I'm very happy that, that ESO will have a very important role in their enabling unprecedented science. Um, just let me run very quickly uh, on, very, um, on a few selected highlights of the science that we have delivered. This is images of exoplanet direct imaging. This is the first on the left, the first exoplanet ever imaged. And you may uh, recall that uh, during 2020, we, um, yeah, there was this image of two exoplanets orbiting the same star uh, for the first time. This, is, this requires uh, fantastic instrumentation uh, and, and we're very happy to support this. Uh, this, I think already mentioned, um, uh, this is, um, work that it's related to um, the Nobel Prize 2020 that was granted in particular for the discovery and the study of Sagittarius A star, a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, uh, thanks to the instrumentation and the VLTI that we have in Paranal, um, the gravitational redshift of a star that orbits um, the 
uh, Sagittarius A star black hole could be measured uh, with all accuracy and even the precession of the orbit as predicted by general relativity could be confirmed also in 2020. Um, uh, this is um, a collection of uh, protoplanetary disks around young stars obtained by ALMA. If you look at the construction book for ALMA, this was the dream of the millimeter radio astronomers um, uh, 25 years ago. They could image these this rings where it is believed that planets form around these stars and it's fascinating to see them now um, become a reality. And of course, uh, we all remember this iconic image uh, of the first image of the supermassive black hole in the center of M87 that was released last year. Thanks, uh, among others, to ALMA and APEX uh, being operational together with other um, uh, millimeter um, radio, um, astron uh, radio observatories. Um, just a word about education of outreach. We also operate um, 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 visitor center with a planetarium here in Garching, um, which is called the Supernova. Uh, this was a donation from a private uh, society um, and uh, we operate it. Uh, we have lots of visitors. It's all about astronomy and we also do teacher trainings. Our products can be downloaded uh free of charge and and we're very happy to engage with society in this further dimension we've actually um done a study about our societal benefits uh, of an organization uh, there's a lot to be noted there um we're not only uh, having an impact on science and engineering but also we have an impact on economy uh, through the um uh, construction and operation of our projects which are very demanding uh, we activate uh, companies uh, and, and uh, they grow their skill sets. Uh, we also have an important contribution on talent development. I will go into this in the next and my last three minutes. Impact on the public. We put a lot of effort in outreach in communicating to the public and also in policy. And um, just let me run quickly on um, these uh, pieces of our uh, societal impact. Um, I already mentioned the 1,000 refereed papers per year. Um, in the last uh, eight years, uh, there's been 8,000 distinct scientists that have accessed our facilities. They have downloaded big amounts of scientific data. Um, uh, we receive every year more than 2,500 observing proposals that provide an oversubscription from a factor of three to six. And last but not least, we're developing technologies uh, that are rather unique and that help not only astronomy, but elsewhere. Um, active optics, I already mentioned, laser guide stars, are, I also mentioned, but you know things like, for example, this absolute multi-line technology for precision measurements, this was developed together with industry because we had the need to develop this and, and then industry took advantage of it. Um, this is probably one part that is of most interest to the audience today, uh, which is the talent development. Just give me some, uh, let me give you some numbers. Um, uh, in the last decade, uh, we have um, received about 200 PhD students from 40 different countries, uh, about 150 postdocs, postdoctoral fellows from 30 countries. We also have internships in a variety of of, of uh, fields, not only research, uh, astronomy and engineering, but also on science writing, on design, even on administration. And I'm very proud to see that some of the people that have engaged in their early careers with this, uh, they have become the leaders of uh, many enterprises around the world, not only in astronomy, but also in other business. So I think we're, 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 we can be uh, legitimately proud that we're having this so positive impact. Um, in society. So this is my, my last slide. Um, uh, I hope I have convinced you that although we do a lot of things, we do all of them together with um, the outside world, to ESO in particular, with the research community, the R&D institutes, we develop our uh, forefront instruments together with them, uh, with the agencies in the member states, with the governments that support us and many other stakeholders. At the end of the day, fostering cooperation in astronomy is one of our two mission elements. And uh, for example, we are doing this through these R&D activities and instrument development. 
we exchange personnel. Um, we have a number of people circulating through ESO directly uh, as uh, students, fellows, and also other staff positions. And they eventually go back in some cases to the member states and elsewhere. Um, we're trying to work together with the community in setting best practices for a number of aspects which are important, like, for example, open data access. Uh, our, uh, our archives, our science archives are open to everyone. All the data become public after one year. Um, time allocation processes, uh, career development, uh, project development, the standards for project development. I think they are very, very important. Um, uh, it's also important that we're um, a central part of uh, astronomy in all uh, uh, in, in all um, yeah, uh, views and in all facets of this world, and in particular in policy developments, that's, that's quite important. We're very active in trying to promote clear skies. Uh, we're concerned and acting on satellite mega constellations um, and etc. So I think this is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Xavier, for this overview of ESO and the glimpse into your career. And also thank you very much for sharing the happy news that at least for starts to be, to be back on the skies partially. That's really good to hear. Yep. So we will now move into the questions and discussion part of today's discourse. Yes. So we have collected a number of questions from our audience in advance from those that register for today's event. So we will start with those questions and then we'll also address any of the questions coming in live. So at this point, I'd like to remind the audience to please submit your questions either via the Q&A on Zoom or via the chat on YouTube. So to kick it off, um, I think I'll pick up a little bit where you left off with your final slide. Um, which connects to working at ESO. So could you perhaps give us an overview of the job opportunities at ESO? Um, how would one uh, start to look for a job at ESO, be it either in scientific research or the technical engineering career path? Yeah, we do have a dedicated portal for this with all the job opportunities that we have, which is called recruitment.eso.org, uh, where we post all of our vacancies. Um, we do have uh, specific programs uh, to engage people, uh, in particular uh, a fellowship program. This is offered on a yearly basis. Uh, our studentship programs, uh, they are also offered on a yearly basis. Uh, by the way, we have uh, separate components for Germany and Chile. Um, and we also have uh, engineering um, fellowships, um, engineering uh, studentships uh, on a slightly more limited um, amount uh, in numbers. And on top of this, we are in the middle of uh, building the ELT. So um, the number of people that we had to recruit in the last year has been um, important. Um, just to give you a flavor, I've lived it in 2019. We had to do something like 50 recruitments um, of all sorts. I mean, this includes scientists, but mostly engineers, I have to say. I mean, to give you an idea, I think that out of the 700 people that work at ESO, probably 300 are engineers. Um, and maybe, I don't know, 150 or so are, are astronomers. And, um, and then, of course, we have all, all administration, we have project managers, we have uh, many other uh, works that, that we also need to attend. But I would encourage you to look at the portal where uh, we have recruitment.eso.org. We, um, uh, by definition, we have to, uh, um, with very few exceptions, all of our vacancies are uh, open. And in fact, they are open to the entire world, um, uh, which is something that I wanted to underline. But in case we have to give preference to anyone, we give it to the member states and Chile for that, for that purpose. Um, just the detail, we have a, um, another type of contracts, which we call local staff uh, contracts for which you need to be a Chilean resident, not a, a Chilean citizen, but you need to be residing in Chile. And then we have a fraction of our people in that, in that uh, contract class. Amia, 
Next one is yours. You're muted still. Sorry, I was muted. So yes, there is a, a, one of the questions that we are asking ourselves as junior members a lot, and it's about like a career for PhD and postdocs in astrophysics and beyond. So um, we wanted to ask you like, with a limited number of permanent positions that we have an increasingly intense competition at the moment, do you think that the current model for research career progression needs to be changed? Um, uh, you, this is, I understand the question not about ESO, but in general. Yes. Yes. From your um, experience. So I understand you work in Spain, right? Yes. So you have seen that in Spain things are very different to any other country as well. I, I, I wouldn't claim that they are better at all than in, in any other country. The point I'm trying to make is that uh, the career path uh, for for research it it is very different uh, from country to country anyway. Um, I I I'm not sure that we can come up to an overall agreement on how this career should be. What I believe we should perhaps uh, all together consider is how do we uh, use the criteria to give jobs to people. I think this, there's a lot there to be discussed and a lot there to be agreed. I, I, um, for years, we have been essentially uh, counting papers, right? Um, uh, then citations become uh, fashionable. Um, I'm not sure we're getting uh, at the right uh, sweet spot in there in in making a fair selection for the people that, that get the jobs. Um, and, and there's, there's uh, probably a lot of progress to be made in there. Um, probably this is not uh, what you wanted me to comment on, but I, th I thought it was an important point to raise. Um, it is certainly true that uh, the uh, career of a scientist, it's, it's a career of obstacles. Um, anywhere in the world, I mean, in the best, in, in the worst system that I know. Um, you have to move every few years uh, from one place to another, normally going to um, another country every time. And uh, yeah, you get yourself at the age of 45 uh, without a job, right? That's, that's not uncommon. And uh, this is really um, a, a challenge uh, for the scientific career. This is considered normal in some countries, in others it is not. And uh, I, I can see the need for um, uh, the good uh, training of scientists that they should, in the early years of their career, move around. I think this comes with a lot of benefits. You see how other places work. And, and so on, but uh, at some point, maybe longer um, periods of, of, uh, of the hiring would be advisable. Um, I'm not a very good fan of uh, permanent jobs uh, forever. I mean, uh, sorry to say this, uh, but, but certainly um, having a perspective, it's important, not only for scientists, but for, for everyone, for engineers and, and, and for everyone. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm, this is probably not what we wanted to hear. No, actually, you, you actually what answered. I, what I feel. No, no, I mean, you, you answer, but I was interested like, to know why you think like a permanent job forever is not a good thing. Yeah, um, it Can is. Can I elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you, you have to grant permanent jobs to a number of people because otherwise organizations will not work. That's, that's very clear. But if you grant every single uh, person a permanent job, then you're blocking the path to, to anyone else because the growth rate at which uh, research institutions and universities in the world grow, it cannot catch up with this. So yes, it is fine. You need a fraction of the people to stay, but you also need to keep the door open. So you give opportunities to the younger generations. So finding the right balance, it's very delicate. Okay, I see. Uh, well, thanks. I'm gonna uh, ask uh, um, a question about the situation that we, we have at the moment. So science and pandemic 
and this is more related to ESO actually. We were wondering like uh, um, what, has, what has been the impact of the pandemic uh, and in which way has changed the work and the workflow at ESO. Yes, uh, so this, this is two separate questions. The first one, I mean, the pandemic is still impacting our work in a significant way. Um, and uh, just coming back to what I said towards the end, we're not an isolated organization, right? I mean, we work together with industry, we work together with R&D institutes, and the outside world is very strongly affected. I mean, our projects, the progress on the development of new instruments of, uh, of the ELT has been strongly affected because people couldn't go to the factories. Uh, it is as simple as that. Or uh, scientists and engineers in the R&D institutes in our member states had limited access to their institutions and to their labs. So um, we estimate that uh, we have accumulated during the year uh, for work that uh, is done by industry um, delays of the order of um, yeah typically um, you know two three months or so um, for work uh, that uh, we have to do together with R and D institutes the uh, delay accumulated is longer than this mm -hmm. and I already showed you a picture of the summit of uh, Cerro Amazonas where where we are building the ELT, where we are erecting the ELT, uh, the work had to stop there in July and we haven't been able to resume yet. So um, internally at ESO, I think we have managed the best we could. Uh, of course, I had to send everyone home in March. Uh, we started to come back very carefully um, around May, uh, starting with the essential people that, for example, had to go to the laboratories and to the workshops. Uh, we never went away from our observatory sites in full. We had to keep a minimal crew in there on strict conditions to keep the place safe and the vital systems alive. Um, we have been progressing uh, in the last months by uh, enabling people to come back and to continue some sort of steady but very viscous progress in in our business um and okay i mean this is as much as we can do today i mean the world moves much slower than it used before march and we have to acknowledge that um i presume uh, the question also goes into uh, things like teleworking and and mobile working as we like to call it we, uh, before we went into the pandemic actually almost two years ago we established the policy at ESO about mobile working, uh, where people can uh, do um, part of their work from um, remote places, from home or for, for somewhere else uh, within some, some constraints. Um, we will have to review this, this policy. We agreed to do it uh, already two years ago. But um, in my view, the, what the phase in which we are currently immersed is not uh, mobile working, this is emergency working. I mean, we're working from home because we cannot work from the premises. That's, that's the, that is a different cause, right? And I, I'm not um, in favor of considering this as an example of something that we will need to follow on. I mean, we're under very uh, stressed circumstances. You have to work from home in a place that it's not optimized for this. You have to take care of all the household uh, duties together with working, the um, uh, frontiers between work and life get uh, diffuse and fuzzy. Um, and, and this is not mobile working in my view. Mobile working is when you go home because you need to concentrate for a day and finish a document, right? You don't want to be swamped by meetings or by people knocking at, at your door. Um, and, and this, is, uh, this is something that we will reconsider in due course, but I don't think that um, the model that we had to implement these days, because we had no other option, it's a model that can illuminate uh, the future of, uh, of, of the way of working at ESO and, and elsewhere. That's, that's, that's my view. Okay. However, it's an experience that's gonna help to develop like it, it is certainly an experience. I mean, for sure, I believe that 
for example, um, uh, travel will be reduced, right? I mean, we are learning that we can do things without having to travel. That's that's a that's a very good thing, right? I mean, not having to travel is great. It's good for the environment. It's good for your life. It's even good for the expenses, right? I mean, for the finances of 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 the organizations. Uh, this is this is all understood. But uh, you know, I don't believe that the current model in which we are working is optimal. It doesn't help teamwork, which is in most cases essential. I mean, it may not be necessary if you're writing a single author paper on uh, something very specific, but for the type of work that an institution like ESO does, teamwork is at the core of, of our success. And, and this uh, is not helped by the way we have to work at, at the moment. I see. I think um, now we will uh, pick up one of the questions that we received live. And so the person is asking you for some advice that you could give to an astronomer who would want to shift uh, his or her career into science operations or science project management. Yeah, that's, um, that's a very good question. Uh, it is unusual. But uh, there are these people who are interested in making that transition. Um, let me explain a little bit how ESO could eventually help here a little bit. Uh, our fellows, our postdoctoral fellows, uh, of course, they uh, are selected because of their research program, but they are required to do some functional work when they come to ESO. Uh, the amount of functional work is uh, different when they are in Europe and when they are in Chile. In Chile is slightly higher um, and it is very much focused actually on operations. So if you um, succeed, I'm not saying it's easy, right? I mean, we, there's a lot of competition and get an ESO fellowship. Uh, you will be asked to do some functional work and that work, um, it's often on the domain of science operations, either on-site or off-site. Uh, and also in some cases in, in uh, project science rather than project management, I would say. But anyway, getting engaged with project development. And we do have some of the fellows who have uh, chosen to uh, follow this, uh, this part of their training um, as their functional duty while they are at ESO. So we do have opportunities here and we do have a lot of people from whom you can learn. And, and this is really a very interesting path forward. Uh, you may know that in other organizations, um, uh, there is a parallel scientific and technical careers, um, which uh, you can jump from one to the other relatively easy. Um, I, I at least know a couple of them. Uh, that also offers that type of opportunity. But for sure, here at ESO, uh, this is something that, that you can that you can do and that, that we can offer. So perhaps also we have time for one or two more questions. Perhaps the one before last is something you very briefly mentioned at the end of your talk is the preservation of quiet and dark skies. Could you perhaps tell us briefly what kind of projects ESO is involved in to ensure that we can continue observing from the ground? And how do we actually make a united front? Because of course, all the individual member states have different policies, but yet we still have to come up with a common policy. Yeah, uh, so um, as I mentioned, all of our um, observatories are in Chile, so we work together with the Chilean government um, side by side to preserve what they call the natural laboratories. I mean, there's a number of these natural laboratories in Chile, which enable unique science to be done. Astronomy is one example, there's, there's others. Um, we have put together with the other um, international observatories on Chilean ground, something that it's called the Observatory for the uh, Protection of the Sky. Um, uh, we're, we're trying to do technical work on this and, uh, for example, you know, developing filters for LED that, uh, that would, uh, um, yeah, uh, yeah, keep the, the sky cleaner of uh, light contamination. 
and and there's a lot of work to do this is a constant battle i mean and it is not an easy one because the uh, at the other side of the scale you ha you have development you you have industrial development in in a number of aspects so uh, the national legislations and in chile i have to say there is a very good one are very important but equally important to the legislation and to passing the acts through the parliaments is the the uh, the specific measures that are adopted that are adopted and and the assessments that need to be carried out uh, to avoid that uh, projects like uh, roads motorways or or industry compounds um, um, are respectful uh, with uh, with a clean sky this is so this is this is one aspect uh, the other one i wanted to comment on is about which is of course very much on the table these days it's on the mega constellations of of satellites um, here we're working together with a number of stakeholders, uh, with other observatories, with the International Astronomical Union, uh, with other national astronomical societies. Our approach has been to talk to these companies uh, so far and to make them aware that maybe with a small change in their designs and in the way they, they, they use and they operate their satellites, um, this could become far more respectful to ground-based astronomy. Um, there's a number of instances uh, that, that we're going to, uh, there's even a UN uh, commission on the peaceful use of the skies, which we're a member of, uh, we're bringing the subject regularly for discussion. At the end of the day, um, uh, space is um, the property of nations, unfortunately. I mean, uh, all this United Nations has no power. On, on space. Um, they can facilitate this, but it's bound to national legislation. So it's again convincing uh, the governments, uh, not only of, of course, of ESO member states, of all the governments of the world, that we need to preserve the sky um, for uh, astronomical observations and for many other purposes. And um, yeah, I mean, this is really a threat for astronomy. It's even a bigger threat for space. Um, enterprises i mean if uh, uh, i mean talking to the ESA director general um, i mean I, I became aware that if there's a collision in low earth orbit between two satellites uh, the cascade of uh, what will uh, follow there it may compromise the use of low earth orbit uh, for many years so this is something that we need to be very, very careful about and we uh, from our modest position we we're, we're trying hard Okay, thank you. Um, there's just time for a very quick question and uh, um, for the last one. So if it were up to you, what would it come after the ELT and ALMA? Uh, I, I don't have an answer for this, but uh, I don't think a bigger thing is the answer at the moment. That's, that's my personal viewpoint. Uh, okay. Maybe it will be in a few years, but you know, a bigger ALMA, a bigger ELT, mm, and uh, I don't think this is the direction to go, but time will tell. I mean, we're very much at the edge of what we can do today. Yeah. Okay. Well, this was the last question. So thank you so much, Xavier, for uh, your time, for your availability to talk to us, uh, to show us like uh, how is uh, ESO and uh, give us this very, very, very interesting overview. And thanks to all the attendees. And uh, we invite you for joining us the next, in the next event in two weeks time on how to present online. It's a workshop given by Hans van der Water from The Floor Is Yours. And um, we'll, we'll organize more discourses and uh, other events, but just keep tuned on the IAU junior member social medias on Twitter and on Instagram and also on our website. So thank you very much for joining us today and see you the next time. Thanks, Xavier, again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.